The United States became the first nation to land a man on the moon in July 1969, making history. After Apollo 17's early cancellation of the Apollo mission, Challenger Houston, how do you copy Houston? Okay, Houston Challenger's go, coming up on 2.30, we're through 19K. History was once again made when the United States became the last nation to send a man to the moon in December 1972. But why did we leave the moon in the 1970s and never come back? The Joe Rogan Experience consistently receives one of, if not the most, listens worldwide. It's understandable why. Joe Rogan has a level of openness and casualness akin to Han Solo that is occasionally appealing. His greatest quality is his capacity to be honest and transparent about anything. However, Joe Rogan has developed some peculiar worldviews as a result of this. Put people on the moon. I do know fuckery. And I, I do know teams, and I do, I, do, I do understand when people are bullshitting people. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of that with, with a lot of the NASA stuff. He is of the opinion that the moon landing was faked, especially because of the convincing documentaries he had watched that persuaded him. Is his claim actually true? What if Apollo 11 never took place and the moon landings were a hoax? Let's find out. You are likely to be terribly unprepared if you find yourself in a discussion about whether humans first set foot on the moon on July 20th, 1969. The common belief is that one of humanity's greatest accomplishments could never be faked by the U.S. government, NASA, the 12 astronauts who have walked on the moon, or the 400,000 individuals involved in the Apollo program. However, some people, especially Joe Rogan, believe the landings were a hoax. They contend that the U.S. government fabricated Apollo 11 and subsequent missions either to give the USSR a significant setback in the space race, to increase funding for NASA, or to deflect attention from the Vietnam War. We can't get there without taking casualties! Havoc, this is one. We need close air Finding proof that the landings were staged is the foundation of any argument for either of these points of view. The claim that there are never any stars in Apollo images is one of the most well-known conspiracy theories. You would anticipate seeing thousands of stars in every astronaut's photograph had they not been obstructed by Earth's light pollution and cloudy atmosphere. Sadly, this argument is based on the fact that the photographs were taken during the moon night. All manned moon missions took place during bright sunny days. Starlight was unable to compete with the moon's extremely dazzling surface because it was too dark to be captured in photographs. Another frequent complaint is that the crosshairs sometimes appear to be behind things in the photographs of the Apollo missions. This would be impossible if the images were real, indicating that they were painted on. However, research conducted on Earth has revealed that the crosshairs appear fainter while viewing brightly lit things. Some of this detail is completely lost when these images are duplicated or scanned, giving the impression that the crosshair is in some pictures behind the subject. Others draw attention to an anomaly in an Apollo 16 mission photograph of a moon rock. Like a lettered movie prop, it looks to have a C written on it. Once more, analyzing the original snapshot reveals that there is no anomaly, the letter C is absent. Most likely, it was a hair or thread snagged in the copying process. A more nuanced defense of the faked landings is based on many misconceptions about NASA technology and lunar physics. The American flag that Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong planted on the moon is a well-known illustration. In some pictures, it seems to flutter in the breeze. A little bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, one more. There we go. When there is no wind on the moon, how is this possible? It's not even fluttering, really. The flag is held out in front of the pole by a horizontal rod. This gives the impression that the wind is preventing the object from drooping. Additionally, there is a fluttering effect because the flag cannot be undone by the moon's feeble gravity. The flags were placed on the moon's surface, and after a brief period of waving, they haven't moved since. The Van Allen belts are possibly the most conclusive proof that the landings were staged. 
There are two enormous belts that encircle the Earth in the form of donuts. They are composed of solar wind-derived, extremely energetic charged particles. Some people think that if humans had traveled through these belts, they would have been exposed to fatal radiation. Before the Apollo missions, this was a legitimate worry. And for this reason, the Apollo 11 team scientists made every effort to keep the astronauts as safe as possible. They used an aluminum casing to shield the spacecraft from radiation. Additionally, they selected a trajectory from the Earth to the Moon that minimized time in the Van Allen belts. The average radiation exposure for the astronauts during the nine Apollo missions that landed on the Moon was 0.46 radiation-absorbed dose, RAD. This demonstrated that NASA was correct in protecting the astronauts from radiation. Although it is less than what certain nuclear energy workers face, 0.46 radians is roughly 10 times more radiation than what medical personnel who regularly use X-ray and radiotherapy machines are exposed to. Of course, there will always be discrepancies and abnormalities in the records that could lead to fresh allegations that the moon landings were staged until we go back to the moon. However, the magnitude and variety of this record alone demonstrate the falsity of each and every one of these assertions. There are 8,400 publicly accessible images from the Apollo moon missions, countless hours of video, a mountain of scientific data, and complete transcripts and audio recordings of every air-to-ground dialogue. In fact, 382 kilograms of moon rock were transported back to Earth by the Apollo crew. A U.S. conspiracy has been ruled out when these pebbles were independently verified as lunar by laboratories all across the world. What, therefore, is the actual reason we haven't visited the moon again? Since the early 1970s, we haven't been to the moon, and the most obvious and simple explanation is that the United States government cut NASA's federal budget, making it impossible for the organization to carry out costly and risky space missions. When adjusted for inflation, the cost of the Apollo program alone came to approximately $260 billion at the time. Despite taking an early lead by launching the first satellite, the first astronaut, and sending probes to Venus and the far side of the moon, the Soviet Union mostly stopped trying to compete once the U.S. won the space race. Sergei Korolev, a brilliant engineer who led the Soviet space program, passed away in the late 1960s. The Soviet government halted financing for the space program without Korolev's advocacy, and the U.S. decided not to pursue its moon mission in the absence of Cold War rivalry. Since there was no means to earn a profit from it at the time, despite widespread popular support for space exploration, the mission to the moon was viewed as a money pit in many ways. However, the U.S. declared its ambition to go back to the moon in 2017. The goal will be to get the first woman up there this time. NASA is finalizing plans to put the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon by 2024, not far away. The mission will go above and beyond previous moon land. That does not, however, guarantee that the program will actually fly to the moon in the middle of the 2020s as planned. After all, the Constellation Lunar Return Project was well underway in the 2000s. Obama scrapped it in 2010 because it was too expensive. Since it was slated to land in 2020, we might have already taken astronauts to the moon if it hadn't been scrapped. But why does it take so long and cost so much money to prepare missions like Constellation and Artemis if we already have the technology to travel to the moon because we did so repeatedly in the 1960s and 1970s? The basic fact is that a lot of the technology and knowledge we use to travel to the moon in the 20th century seems to have been lost. Although it seems impossible that this could be the case, NASA was in a different position following the funding cut in 1972, and it was unable to save every aspect of the program. NASA has already faced criticism for failing to preserve important items, including the taped over raw footage of the moon landing. Naturally, we still have a ton of footage of the moon landing because we have the live TV feed from the event. However, the unprocessed, low framerate stream that wasn't acceptable for broadcast was the material that was lost. But it's not only those cassettes, virtually everything that contributed to the success of the lunar landing has vanished. We could have designs for rockets and lunar modules, but we don't have the engineers who turned those designs into a working spaceship that can put people on Earth's nearest neighbor. The program was developed by hundreds of thousands of great engineers, designers, and physicists. 
we can no longer reach the moon in the same manner as we did in the 1960s without those very same people. In fact, due to the budget cuts, companies producing special parts for space flights closed, so we no longer even have access to the same building materials. So neither of those things are known to us, despite how much information about lunar technology is and has been available in books and online for decades. We've lost the technology we used since it was so very sophisticated. Despite your best efforts, there will always be details that are forgotten, minor adjustments, or calculations that were crucial to the mission's success but have since been lost to time. Because of this, we are unable to simply recreate all the lunar modules and the Saturn V rocket in their original configuration and launch to the moon once more. It's interesting that attempts have been made to recreate that machinery, in particular, the massive F-1 engine found within the Saturn V rocket. It is still the biggest and most potent rocket ever used, standing over 360 feet tall. An F-1 engine that hadn't been used since 1973 was rebuilt in the 2010s in an effort to resurrect the technology and, ideally, apply it to the creation of next launch systems. Engineers call combustion instability or chugging have been a nagging problem for the F-1. During many tests, these vibrations have literally ripped apart the engine. NASA may be able to save money on the future of space exploration by rediscovering this technology because the F-1 engine is a relatively straightforward structure while being incredibly large. Even with apart from the Saturn V, one of the most well-known launch vehicles in the world and possibly the one most crucial to human space exploration, it was still a very challenging task to complete. There are yet more reasons not only why we shouldn't reuse Apollo-era technology, but also why it's probably for the best that we don't. Giant, single-use rockets are horrible for the ecology and sustainability in the 21st century, which is why there has recently been an emphasis on reusable vehicles. SpaceX leads the field in terms of reusable spacecraft with the Falcon 9, while other private businesses like Virgin and Blue Origin are developing a variety of modules and components that will be useful for several different applications. Lift off of the Falcon 9. A similar approach is being taken by NASA, which needs reusable parts for Artemis. Additionally, we have substantially more space research completed even without visiting the moon thanks to advances in technology. To put it simply, given enough time, we can accomplish all of the Apollo program's goals more effectively. One more explanation for why we don't simply return to the moon is that it's challenging. One of the most challenging and ambitious scientific projects ever is sending people to the moon and returning them. NASA is still the only space agency that has sent astronauts to walk on the moon out of all the others that are now operating. The second largest budgeted organization, the China National Space Administration, isn't any closer to completing the task either. On the other hand, the moon that Neil Armstrong and the other Apollo astronauts left behind some 50 years ago is not the same moon that NASA is aiming to visit. It is not the bone-dry mass that researchers had long believed it to be especially when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon's surface for the first time in 1969. Instead, the moon is moist and full of water, much of which is frozen in the ominous craters near its poles. It will therefore be quite different from the Apollo missions when NASA sends astronauts to the moon's surface for the next time, which is anticipated to happen in the coming years. President Barack Obama urged NASA to focus future human exploration missions beyond the lunar surface to an asteroid and Mars in 2010, during a speech at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I just have to say pretty bluntly here, we've been there before, he said. There's a lot more of space to explore and a lot more to learn when we do. Since then, the United States has changed its strategy, making the moon the focus of its exploration objectives once more. NASA has actual momentum and bipartisan political support for one of the most ambitious human space travel initiatives in decades, thanks to its Artemis program, which was developed during President Donald Trump's watch and endorsed by the Biden administration. It started with the unmanned launch of the Orion spacecraft and its enormous SLS moon rocket. There will be further astronaut manned missions after the Artemis WUST mission with the first one orbiting the moon and the last one touching down there. 
and why go back to the moon? The presence of water, according to Thomas Zerbikin, the recently retired director of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, is the starting point for the solution. In an interview, Zerbikin remarked that it's important to recognize that we're going back to a moon that's really different from the moon we left when we took off during Apollo. Yeah, University of Michigan in this device, uh, we, we uh, calibrated it and it went there and uh, we learned a lot about the environment of Mercury, Mercury itself, and much more interesting. The moon was completely dry. Our perceptions of the moon are very varied. Because of this, NASA has prioritized creating a long-lasting presence on the moon, a key component of its long-term space plans. It will enable the program to practice sustainable space living. It will enable researchers to take advantage of the moon's rich scientific potential to understand how Earth arose. In years to come, it might also act as a stepping stone to Mars and other deep space locations. In addition to being essential for maintaining human life, water's component elements, hydrogen and oxygen, can be used as rocket fuel, turning the moon into a gas station in outer space. As a result, spacecraft may recharge on the moon rather than hauling all of the fuel from Earth, which could be crucial for long-duration missions. The moon also makes for a comparatively simple launching pad to distant parts of the solar system because its gravity is only one-sixth that of the Earth's. The moon, too, has a tale to tell, one that relates to both the creation of the solar system and Earth. It functions as a time capsule without an atmosphere. The footprints of the Apollo astronauts are still visible, unaltered by weather or wind, as are the scars left by the asteroids and comets that bombarded Earth for billions of years during the early solar system's development. The path to life is more important than finding life itself, according to Zerbukin. The violent processes that formed our planets and scarred their surfaces can be learned a lot about from the moon. Part of our past is there, hanging over our heads, and traveling there is certainly feasible. The journey to the moon is incredibly challenging. Living there is significantly more difficult, and NASA doesn't have much expertise with it. Long-term lunar homesteading, or the transition from exploration to expansion, will need a significant investment in new technology and resources. Because of this, NASA is considering putting a nuclear reactor on the moon. It's one of several projects NASA has started as part of its Artemis program, which is intended to support astronauts staying on the moon for protracted periods of time when they'll need power, transportation, and access to the moon's resources. Along with instruments to extract the water and shape the lunar regolith, also known as moon dirt, into bricks for habitation, they would require habitats, rovers, and mining equipment. The project is still very much in its early phases, and NASA has not yet received all of the funds it needs. Despite the optimistic promises emanating from the agency's highest levels, a sustainable presence is still years away, and the technological difficulties are enormous. However, NASA has started to develop the technologies required to keep people alive on the surface for a lengthy amount of time. Three companies received $5 million contracts from the agency and the Energy Department in June of last year to develop nuclear power systems that might be ready to launch by the end of the decade for a test on the moon. The systems would last roughly 10 years and provide 40 kilowatts of power, which is sufficient to power six to seven American families. Using arrays that point vertically and capture the angle of the sun over the horizon, NASA is also attempting to construct solar farms Additionally, it is investigating the best ways to utilize in situ resources, which are those that are already there, such as the regolith. Pam Melroy, a former astronaut and the deputy NASA administrator, said in an interview that humanity had the chance to create a house using resources found on Earth. Therefore, we should consider using lunar regolith to construct facilities, and NASA is funding a number of initiatives in this direction. The Apollo program was significant because it took the impossibly difficult and made it feasible. We will now repeat that procedure with a different goal in mind. This time we return to the moon to study, live, work, develop and produce in order to venture further into space and conduct further research. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.